Kurt is Anthony Presto. He's from the San Joaquin Valley Pollution Control District. And um, take it away, Anthony. Thank you very much. What we'd like to do today is, is uh, those of you who have um, seen one of our presentations before, uh, there'll be quite a bit of similarities, but there'll also be a lot of updates on new information. And those of you who haven't, it'll be a great introduction, kind of an Air Quality 101, talking about air quality in the San Joaquin Valley, um, the, the struggles that we have, why we have air pollution as a problem in the San Joaquin Valley. And if you can go to the next one right away, please. And, and uh, and uh, the progress that's being made and, and what we're doing to continue that progress. Um, th this is the San Joaquin Valley Air Basin. It consists of eight counties from San Joaquin down to Kern. These highlighted areas are the three regions uh, that we have in the valley. Uh, we're in the northern region consisting of San Joaquin, Stanislaw, and Merced counties. Our office is in Modesto. Our main office is in Fresno, uh, and that's our central region with Madera, Fresno, Kings counties. And uh, Tulare and Kern is our southern region with a, um, another office in Bakersfield. Um, how many people have been hearing about the fires going on? You know, the Ferguson fire is taking place right now in uh, Mariposa County, and it's pretty much affecting us right across here with uh, smoke impacts. And, and what happens from time to time, you know, we're the ones that actually coined the phrase wildfire season. And that's what we're in right now as uh, uh, the summer gives us those, those wildfires and we have um, a high pressure system that tends to hold our air pollution down at ground level. And right now, the smoke from those fires is funneling into that area of the valley. <clears throat> Now, we have a governing board uh, that sets our rules and regulations. They are mostly made up of elected officials, um, a county supervisor from each of these eight counties, uh, five city council representatives uh, that rotate between small, medium, and large-sized cities in the San Joaquin Valley, and then two more members that are not elected officials. They were actually appointed by the governor. One is a scientist. Uh, who specializes in air pollution, and the other is a medical doctor specializing in the effects of air pollution on the body. Can I go to the next one, please? Thanks. So we are a government agency, and, and um, our, our mission is protecting public health. And, and uh, the way that we do that is trying to find every strategy possible to reduce air pollution in the San Joaquin Valley. And, and always with, with the Valley's economic prosperity in mind as well as public health. And those two things, uh, what most people think is that they would work against each other. But there is definitely ways to make those things work together so that good air quality and, um, and, and business uh, can actually benefit from each other. Can we go to the next one? Now, why do we have an air quality problem? I mentioned that high pressure system, and that is one of the main things in the San Joaquin Valley from the satellite image. You can see there's mountains almost completely surrounding, forming a bowl, and this fog that's trapped in there really paints a very clear picture. Whatever comes into the valley with air pollution, whatever uh, pollution that we f make here or form here, it stays, and we don't tend to have enough of the types of, of mixing, the types of, of uh, weather conditions, storms with both wind and rain, because it really takes both of those together to effectively clean the air. Uh, we don't get enough of that. So it's not so much that we make a great deal of air pollution right here in the valley. As a matter of fact, um, the Los Angeles area, or South Coast Air Basin, which, is the lar which has the worst air quality in the United States, is only a little bit worse than here in the San Joaquin Valley. They're out open to the ocean, so it does come in and, and clean it out more often, and then they build it right back up. They create 10 times more air pollution than we do in the valley with a problem that's only a little bit worse. The Bay Area? Not much of a problem because it's so windy there and they're out there almost practically right in the middle of the ocean. And then, of course, you get some breezes that blow it into here. But a majority of our air pollution we make here ourselves. And I think I've, I've got a slide later that's going to show what those percentages are. And, and of course, you know, we do have a high rate of population. We have economic issues. All of these things uh, tend to filter in. But our main issues are geography, um, uh, topography and you know the fact that we're in a bowl 
that we have the type of weather condition uh, that forms inversion layers every day, pushing air pollution down to ground level. And the next one, please. So when you're looking right now, those fires uh, taking place, uh, sending the smoke into the valley, and you actually can look to the east, and you'll see a, a, a wall of smoke. And, and if you look closely, you'll see an area where it actually stops. And it's almost a straight line. And that's where the inversion layer forms. Um, and that's why it stops at that point and holds everything down at ground level. So there's two types of pollution that we deal with that are mostly man-made here in the San Joaquin Valley. Those are ozone pollution and fine particulate matter. Now, particulate matter is, is directly emitted. That could be smoke or dust. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But first, ozone pollution, because right now in the summertime, that's the main time that we have uh, this type of pollution. Most people know it as smog. And it has to be formed. It's not directly emitted. It's formed when you get all of these different emissions. The big one is vehicle emissions motor, uh, from mobile sources. So you get nitrogen oxide, volatile organic compounds. All those things are mixing from, from motor vehicles, from uh, uh, confined animal livestock uh, emissions, from uh, aerosol sprays and degreasers. All those things are, are mixing. And when they're baked by the sun, it's just like, it's like a recipe. You have these ingredients, and they're cooked. So when they are baked by the sun, they are forming another pollutant that is worse than the individual pollutants. Um, and it turns into ozone, a corrosive gas that damages lung tissue. And when you get high um, or uh, high concentrations of this, you know, a lot of people are more sensitive to it than others. Folks with, with emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma, they feel it before, you know, a, a you know, normal healthy adult does. The, the children whose lungs are still developing, the elderly, those people are what we call the sensitive groups, and they're going to feel it before others do. But eventually, if it gets high enough in concentration, everybody feels it, and it's almost like getting a sunburn on the inside of your lungs. Can we go to the next one, please? So fine particulate matter. We actually see more fatalities in the San Joaquin Valley from this type of pollutant than we do with ozone pollution, because what fine particulate matter does, it's, it's a solid. And uh, it's uh, PM 2.5 is what we call it, and that stands for particulate matter that's 2.5 microns and smaller. That can get um, through most of your air conditioner filters. It gets through the little hairs, uh, past the hairs in your nose that are supposed to be your own filter and can get deep into the lungs, but it's so small, it can get deep uh, even farther and into the bloodstream. So, so the things that you're looking at from fine particulate matter is reduced lung function, um, asthma exacerbations, lung infections, and then as it gets into the bloodstream, it increases the risks of heart attack and stroke. So, so that's why this is such a, a difficult animal to tackle, and we have so many different uh, sources. Uh, the same sources that produce ozone pollution, nitrogen oxide, contribute to fine particulate matter, and then it can be a any source of smoke, which we're getting uh, some of now. In the wintertime, we have uh, a lot of residential wood burning that goes on. This is a, a chief um, source of fine particulate matter, but also dust. Can we go to the next one? So where's all this stuff come from? When we look at uh, nitrogen oxide, which is really the most important player in forming ozone and contributes to particulate matter pollution, uh, a strong majority of this is mobile sources. Well, guess what? As a local air district, we don't have regulatory authority over the biggest source of nitrogen oxide. Um, that authority is, um, uh, goes to the, the State Air Resources Board or the Environmental Protection Agency. Local air districts only have regulatory authority over stationary sources. So we're the ones that issue permits and require rules and regulations of, of all industry in the valley, all the, the factories and uh, uh, any place that has a, a large boiler and uh, fireplaces and the gas stations that have um, uh, volatile organic compounds that might uh, seep out of gas tanks, things like that. Uh, your, your auto body shops with uh, paints and, and, and such and degreasers. But the biggest source is the heavy duty diesel trucks. 
They're not only um, they're, they're not only emitting a lot of nitrogen oxide, but also particulate matter. And those old trucks can go on forever. It's not difficult at all for a truck to go a million miles in comparison to your car that might go one or two hundred thousand miles. And diesel is a lot dirtier than than uh, gasoline. However, the new trucks out there. Um, 2010 and newer are 95% cleaner than a truck that's you know, 15, 15 years old. So uh, the California Air Resources Board has actually implemented a state rule for trucks to um, be changed out a little faster and, and older trucks to be replaced. And the, the Air District has provided an incentive because we can't regulate those, but we can give uh, some uh, money, some uh, incentive money to uh, some businesses to help them in making that replacement faster than they need to. Once they get to a certain point, 18 months before uh, the regulation kicks in for them, we can't help them anymore because we can't give you money for something that you already have to do. Okay, the next one. So volatile organic compounds, that's the other part of that pie that creates ozone. A majority of these things are stationary. Uh, so we do have a little bit more uh, regulatory authority over those. Um, it is these confined animal facilities that tend to create a majority of that volatile organic compound. And um, you know, that's as, you know, a lot of people talk about what's coming out of uh, the ends of cows and make a big joke about it, you know, and, and, you know, it's real, but what's actually creating a majority of that pollution are things like the, the waste lagoons and the feed piles. And both of those things are things that you can cover, which makes it not too difficult to, to um, actually put some controls on those. And the next one is uh, sources of fine particulate matter when you take a look at that, we have a lot comes from farming operations, and there is uh, dust coming from there. There are some rules um, that um, place some controls over large farming operations, uh, road dust, uh, fugitive windblown dust. There's, you know, these are things that are kind of difficult to control. To, to a degree, we, we can place some controls on them. See fireplaces and wood stoves over there. When you look at the entire year, it shows only 6%. But what's really important is during the winter months, it becomes much more than 6%. From November through February, we're looking at, at about a third, about 30 33% up to 17 tons a day. And, and that is actually one of the easiest things to be, place a control on. And um, so that's why we have the, the residential wood burning rule, check before you burn. Is everybody familiar with that? Who, is there anybody who has not heard of rules on your fireplace? Good, everybody knows about it. Okay, and, <laughs> and so there are some days that you can't burn in your fireplace and we are uh, slowly trying to gear people toward uh, making changes like going from uh, an open fireplace to an EPA certified wood stove or a pellet stove or even better natural gas. Um, next one please, where are we? Okay, so uh, we mentioned air pollution coming from other areas earlier. And I, I mentioned that about 75% of it, we make our own. And a lot of people uh, often thought that it was all coming from the Bay Area, which isn't true. Uh, about 25% coming from other areas, uh, you know, a big portion of that coming from the Bay Area. But in a study completed a few years ago by UC Davis, they found that 10% is actually coming from Asia over the Pacific Ocean. And that's something that, how do you control that? You know, uh, China is just starting to think about controlling air pollution. Uh, so there are a lot of different factors uh, to take into account when we're thinking about air pollution and trying to find ways to control it. Some things are completely out of our control. Next one, please. Um, all that being said, a lot of progress is being made. And uh, in 2000, um, 17 uh, was uh, definitely a record year for ozone pollution and, and also you know, one of the better years for particulate matter pollution seeing uh, since 2002 measuring here a lot more good days and a lot less bad days than there used to be. This peak right here, that happened during the, the drought. You know, the drought affects us in so many ways, not just lack of water, but when you don't have water, you have a lot more 
dry conditions with a lot of dust. You have drier um, forests, so there's going to be a lot more and more intense uh, wildfires taking place. And in the winter time, when we're depending on rain and wind to clean up particulate matter pollution from residential wood burning, it wasn't happening. And so it just continues to build up and build up. And that's what happens with air pollution. Ozone pollution tends to decrease at night and, um, uh, and, and it, it, there's actually um, pollutants that scavenge or eat up ozone pollution at nighttime and then it builds up during the day. But particulate matter doesn't do that. It builds up and it just stays there until there's a great uh, weather condition that comes along and cleans it up. Can we have the next one so we can see ozone pollution and, and how that has been also improving over the years. There are three different air quality standards that we have to try to meet uh, from the EPA directing us for ozone pollution. There used to be a one hour ozone standard. That is no longer uh, in play because we ended up meeting that standard and it was replaced by much stricter standards, the eight hour standard. And what the difference is, the eight hour ozone standard looks at air pollution over a long period of time, an eight hour period of time. It has a much lower threshold where ozone or the one hour ozone measured uh, ozone in peaks. And uh, a 1997 standard was applied with a deadline to meet that uh, standard by 2024. We're ahead of schedule on meeting that one right now. At one time, it was considered impossible. But the one hour standard was also considered impossible and we're the, the only air district that has actually um, been in um, what's called extreme non-attainment, which is the worst you can get for an, uh, a standard and then met that standard. Uh, 2008 standard was applied in 2008 and uh, we have to meet that by 2030. Not looking as promising at this point. The technology isn't quite there. And then of course the 2015 ozone standard of 70 parts per billion we have until 2040 to meet that. Right now that completely looks impossible with um, the um, the technology not there at all to meet that. That's why we really depend on technology advancement. And we have a, an incentive program to help spur uh, technology for, for companies to come with us with new, come to us with new ideas. And the next one, where are we going here? Oh, great. So cleaning up air, air pollution is not the only thing that's important. It's also important to know where we are with air pollution. It's important for you to know um, what kind of air quality is out there right now before you're gonna go running or do yard work or before the football teams are out there practicing. And that's why we give you the real-time air advisory network. So you can actually go on our website or use your, your iPhone app, or it doesn't have to be an iPhone. It used to only be an iPhone. We just improved that. So no matter what type of smartphone you have, uh, you can um, uh, download the app or on your computer, go to myran.com and get an actual picture of the most current air quality information uh, available. And it was recently improved so that you don't just look at the closest air monitoring station, and there is one very close to here, just a few blocks away, uh, but no matter where you are in the San Joaquin Valley, the app will zero in on your location, your square mile and take all of the information available, not just from the closest monitoring station, but things like weather, emissions inventory, uh, using a modeling program to give you the most accurate current information uh, for your location, and that's updated every hour. So that's, that's really important uh, before you're going to, to be doing something outdoors. You can look at your phone and, and see you know, whether it's level one, two, three. Can we go to the next one? I'm not sure if I have showing that. And, and this is what it looks like when you go to, to uh, RAN, Real-Time Air Advisory Network. And you, you, as you can see, air quality doesn't stay the same all day long. You know, it can, at, eight, at six o'clock in the morning, it might be good in the summer and then go up to an un unhealthy level. One to five is, is what we uh, show that range to be. And um, the app is now available and it works the same way as, as our uh, real-time air advisory network on our, our website. Okay. 
All right, let's talk about what can help you as a business. There's a lot of uh, incentives and grants that are available to residents in the valley, to farmers, to businesses, to help you make changes quicker than you would normally uh, do so before somebody tells you you have to or before something actually breaks, you know, as soon as you uh, want to start thinking about getting a new car or something like that. Let's, let's go ahead and advance. Um, yes, the Drive Clean program has funding available for residents in the Valley to pretty much do the best thing that they could do for air quality, and that's go from a gasoline vehicle to an electric vehicle. If you get a completely electric vehicle, you're going to get $3,000 back from the Air District. You get a plug-in hybrid. Are, is, they, uh, is everybody familiar with the plug-in hybrids, how that's different from uh, completely electric cars? And you know, We made that transition when people started buying hybrids like the Toyota Prius. And then as uh, they went to completely electric vehicles that are um, charged on and run on battery, there's that in-between uh, factor that allows you that range where you can charge your vehicle and maybe get 50 miles on just electricity and then it switches over to the gasoline engine so you're not worried about and you don't get that thing called range anxiety that a lot of electric uh, drive, uh, vehicle drivers have. So you, get a, a, you still get, get a... Um, uh, a grant on that, it's 2000 whereas if you go completely electric because there's no emissions there, that's $3,000. The state also gives uh, an, um, a grant as well, so it's $2,500 going to an electric car. So if you get a Nissan Leaf, people like to talk about Teslas, that's the rich man's electric car, I don't like that, but, um, or um, maybe a Ford Focus electric, and there's, there's actually a lot of different models out there. You can get a total of $5,500 back within, within 60 days uh, when, you, when you go to those. And then, of course, electricity is cheaper than gasoline. Does that apply when you lease one, too? Yes, it does. The thing that I think this is the last year that if you actually purchase you get that tax credit of $7,500. Um, you don't get that when you lease. And I, I leased um, a year ago a Nissan Leaf, and it was the best financial decision I've ever made in my life. Because <laughs> uh, you know, I don't even see much of a difference in um, charging, it at ho charging it at home. And so it, it's a lot cheaper than gasoline, and it's rides so smooth. And, and you're not creating any um, emissions. And we're seeing a difference in the valleys. You, can, you uh, saw those graphs and charts showing that air quality is improving, and it's changes like that. You know, there's uh, a lot of um, debate. People will say, well, they, they're creating a lot of emissions and air pollution when they're making these cars. Well, it's really not much more uh, than, you know, when you're uh, making a regular car. I mean, there's, there's batteries, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of um, metal, all these things are, are taken into account, but we're not creating the emissions here in the valley or where we're driving it. Hang on a second. And it makes a huge difference for us here. Um, the Charge Up program is another incentive to help us create that infrastructure that we desperately need here in the San Joaquin Valley so people aren't so worried about where they're going to charge their vehicles. And uh, businesses and public agencies uh, can, get this, um, can get this grant for just for their employees if they just want to put a charging station in the parking lot for everybody to use. Uh, we prefer them to be used for the public so that they're available to everybody, but either way, you can do that. And it's um, $5,000 for a single port charging station, $6,000 for dual, and you get a maximum credit of um, $50,000. So you could put uh, 10 charging stations there at your business or your public agency uh, for, for people to use. Uh, they have one at the mall, uh, they have them at Stan State, the, um, the dealers that uh, sell electric cars have these charging stations, and some places you can use them for free. If you come to the Valley Air District, our office, you can charge there for free. And I know you can charge for free at Stan State. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and your office too. Our cars always park there. Yeah, <laughs> you just, uh, you have one charging yeah, one. state, okay. Um, so and so, and the public benefits program, that's, that's for uh, public agencies. And Carrie, you guys used that. And, and you're able to use that whole 20,000 for one electric vehicle, right? Yep. 
And so that's a big help for a public agency. Okay, and next please. Uh, these things that are geared toward businesses, uh, we're going to uh, give you some funding for the truck voucher program was fifty thousand uh, dollars for a truck for small businesses uh, we're helping farmers get ag pumps because a lot of those old pumps were running on diesel uh, but uh, there's a much cleaner diesel now and there's also electric pumps and you're going to get a bigger incentive to go to an electric pump uh, there's school bus replacement uh, we're assisting in putting in um, bike lanes i saw you look at your watch so i'll try and oh, talk no, no, faster no, no, actually, people are texting me i'm just uh, looking at who it is ah okay um, <laughs> don't, don't take that the so <laughs> there's there's a huge there's so many actually so many incentives now that I, I get too jumbled up talking about them and it would take too much time the the best thing for anyone to do, uh, whether you're a resident, a business, uh, work at a public agency, a school, go to our website at valier.org, look up grants and incentives, and if you've got some type of engine or something that runs on gasoline uh, or you know, even a lawnmower, yeah, and we're gonna talk about the lawnmower, yeah, I think I have that next. That. You know, next take time. a look at that, and there's probably an incentive program for you. Clean Green Yard Machines is our incentive for you to get rid of your gasoline uh, lawnmower and go to an electric one. You know, I can remember when I was a kid and my, my friend had a, an electric lawnmower and it ran on a cord. That's what I still use because those do still cost less. Right. And whether you want to get that type or a cordless type, you can use this program to do that and it's going to give you half of your money back. They work just as well as a gasoline mower if you're in an ordinary situation. If you've got a whole acre that's all bumpy and everything, you know, it might not be the best thing for you, but any residential neighborhood type lawn, you don't need anything better and you're going to get rid of gas spills and oil spills and all the smoke that comes from it and the noise. One gasoline lawnmower is like driving 12 cars for the same you know, period of time. So that makes a big difference. They don't have a catalytic converter on them. So your car is actually cleaner than your lawnmower. So we, we'd like to get you to, to change those out. Um, the uh, Drive Clean program is good, great for residents as well. And then there's also our Burn Cleaner program. We realize that some people still do like to, to burn wood in their fireplace. We'd like you to move from that open fireplace, which is uh, not very efficient at all at heating your home, creates a great deal of particulate matter pollution. If you go to an EPA certified wood stove or a pellet stove, it's going to be a lot more efficient. You're gonna use less of the wood. It's going to heat your house a lot better and it cuts down the particulate matter from say 50 grams per hour down to maybe two. Uh, but even better is going to natural gas. That's the cleanest, most efficient way to heat your home. And it uses a lot less natural gas than your whole house heater does because it operates at a much lower BTU level. And, and then you don't even have to worry about whether or not it's a burn day. So, so we have incentives for all three of those things. For um, burn cleaner, you get, is it 1,000 or 1,500? I think it's $1,000 back uh, if you upgrade from an open fireplace or an older dirty burning wood stove that's not EPA certified to an EPA certified wood or pellet stove or natural gas. And if you go to the natural gas route, there's also a little extra up to another $500 for whatever it costs for the installation. And usually that covers the installation costs. Can we go next? And tune in and tune up um, is uh, a program that has really worked great at getting gross polluters off of uh, the road. And we've been doing this for quite a few years now. Every couple of weeks, somewhere in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, we have an event. People uh, bring in their cars. Um, Valley Can actually runs this for us. We con uh, contract with them, and they'll do as many as 525 cars in a day. They give them a mock emissions test. This is not your real smog test. And a lot of people come there thinking, that it is and we try to make it very clear that it's not what it does is give an emissions test to determine if you would pass your real smog test and if you don't you get a voucher good for up to uh, $500 to take it to a, um, a certified smog shop and we have a whole list of them and people actually representing those smog shops at those events to um, make your appointment for you right then and there so you can get it fixed so it will be smog ready and those cars that um, are 1999 or older, 
most likely not worth fixing, they can uh, get into the vehicle replacement program. And you can actually get even more money than the, than the drive clean program to replace that old car with something newer and cleaner. Not, not brand new, they're, they're working with agencies like um, I, I think CarMax, uh, so, so uh, lease returns, and often getting into um, used Nissan Leafs or, or uh, Chevy Volts uh, or uh, Toyota Priuses. So we want to get them into the cleanest vehicle possible. The cleaner it is, the bigger uh, of incentive you get. And uh, this has you know, really uh, been taking a lot of gross polluters off the road. It's been working very well. Uh, the, the next one, I think, is taking place in Fresno. We just went, had one in Stockton in Merced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, next month, there'll be one in Turlock. So and it, we're, we're hitting every county in the San Joaquin Valley every couple of weeks, uh, a different location. What's the next one? So what can you do? Taking a look at all these things I've talked about, you know, probably one of the best things you can do is look at our incentives and grants page on our website. Um, think about what you're doing every day that's affecting air pollution in the San Joaquin Valley. What kind of an impact are you making? And we ask that you just make one change. Not everybody can do everything. Not everybody is ready to go buy an electric car, but maybe you're ready to start carpooling once or twice a week, or riding your bike sometimes, or walking, or just even as, as little as bringing your lunch to work. Instead of going out at lunchtime, creating unnecessary emissions, spending more money, probably not eating as healthy as you would if you were bringing your lunch to work. There's so many things. Hairspray, you know, the type of hairspray you use. These things all make a difference. Using a pump instead of an aerosol. Uh, all of these things, if everybody does something, we can gain ground a lot faster than people not thinking about it. And that's what healthy air living is all about. Um, not idling your vehicle when you don't need to. That doesn't mean at a stoplight. That means avoiding the drive-through. Uh, you, you know, this doesn't have to affect businesses. Just park your car at McDonald's and go inside, and you can get your quarter pounder. Or, oh, that's, oh, that's Burger King, isn't it? No, uh, you can get your big. Right. Is, they, they do it anyway. You can get your hamburger or, or your latte and go inside of Starbucks or whatever instead of going through the drive-through. You're going to save money because you're going to save gas and you're going to create less emissions. The um, a big one that we see and it really made a difference when we were trying to reach the the one-hour ozone attainment standard uh, is picking up the kids from school, and not idling your vehicle when you're doing that because. All of them, everybody, between 2 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the worst time for ozone pollution, we saw a huge increase as, uh, as school started. We, we were getting cleaner and cleaner every year. June, July, some of the hottest months of, in the year uh, that used to be very high in ozone, and we were uh, seeing um, that we weren't exceeding the standard anymore. And then late August would come, early September, and we'd see numbers just spike. And it was all, um, we were seeing it happening when school's getting out. And, uh, you know, it could be a, for a 25, 30 minutes, 50 cars all lined up, everybody's, uh, everybody's using their air conditioner. It's actually cooler outside the car. I, I, I used to do this, and I used to embarrass my daughter, and a lot of people, uh, I think it's a funny story because I, <laughs> I would, uh, on my, my Friday off, because we get every other Friday off, we have that uh, 980 schedule at the Air District, and so on Fridays I'd go and pick up the kids from school. My daughter, at the height of her embarrassment stage, 6th, 7th grade, I pull up uh, on, uh, to the curb, turn off my car, get outside, and I'm waiting you know, just sitting outside my car. What's more embarrassing to, to a 13-year-old than people seeing their parent? Yeah. She comes out, she, Dad, what are you doing? Get in the car, get in. And, and the driver, the uh, passenger side's locked, and she's trying to get, get inside the car. What are you doing? <laughs> so, so you can avoid uh, that extra um, emissions by not idling your vehicle and maybe get the extra plus of embarrassing your kid, too. So, and what's next? Uh, so, so that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, we would love for you to join us on social media. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and we have the, uh, the smartphone app that will give you information immediately on air quality, 557-6400. Our main website is valleyair.org. We also have a lot of fun stuff at healthyairliving.com.